Thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. Hopefully we'll have a fun session talking about design thinking. Um, you heard a little bit about my background. I'm not going to belabor the point and talk about myself a whole bunch, but just so you know who's up here talking to you. Um, my name is Casey. I am currently a professor of creativity and innovation at Sheridan College. I say that I only took the job because that's a really cool title, um, and that's partially true. But I'm, uh, my day job is pretty exciting because I get to teach people things like design thinking, how to be creative, how to build your creative skill, and how to find ways to develop innovative solutions. And I know a lot of you are in the realm of developing innovative health solutions, so hopefully this will be a useful session for you. And as you heard, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started a lot of startups. I uh, love starting new companies, starting new things. Once they're going, I kind of lose a bit of interest and end up exiting or selling, but I love starting new things. So if anybody wants to chat at all, even during the break, about entrepreneurship, starting businesses, anything like that, feel free to come and chat with me. And um, the other thing I'll mention is that I have worked at U of T and at Humber, but when I was at U of T, I ran one of the incubators there. And some of you may have some interactions with, with U of T, so if you want to chat about incubators, things like the health uh, H2I incubator or anything like that, I'm also happy to chat about that. So what are we here to talk about today? Creativity and innovation, my specialty. And I want to start us off by asking you all to think a little bit and hopefully willing to participate a bit. What do you think creativity and innovation mean? And do you think that they have different meanings? A lot of times we use these words synonymously. That was creative. That was innovative. But do those words mean the same thing? And if not, what do you think they mean? Anybody want to take a stab at what either of those words mean or how they might be different? This is just like when I'm at Sheridan, too. Yes? Okay, so we've got creativity is making something new, but innovating is adding to or iterating on something that's existing. Maybe, maybe one suggestion. Do we have any other suggestions we want to throw on the table about these two words? Yeah? What was the innovation part? Sorry? has to be new, but creative just has to be creative. <laughs> Tell me a bit more. What does it mean to be creative then? Not sure? OK. Anybody else want to take a stab at what it means to be creative? Yes? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I like where you're going with this. I like where you're going with this. For those at home, we're saying maybe creativity is about coming up with things that are novel and out of the box, but innovation is about adopting those ideas. Yeah. Okay, so creativity being, sorry, what was the creativity part again? What did you say? Using existing things, but innovation being generating something completely new. All right, well, I will give you now, now that we've had a bit of a discussion and we thought about it, I'll give you the scholarly definitions that we use when we're measuring and testing for creativity and innovation. Um, and you can see if you agree or not. Um, but creativity is defined as ideas that are novel and useful. So as long as something meets those two criteria, novel and useful, you can say it's creative. So a novel idea, meaning something unique, outside the box, something that's different. I think I heard off the wall or wild, things like that. Um, that is one piece of creativity, so being unique. But the other piece that often gets forgotten is it should be useful. It should be something that can actually have meaning or exist. I can think of, I don't know, a new animal that is half unicorn and half lion, but that doesn't really exist in the real world and it's not very useful. So creativity, the bar for measuring, is this creative? Is to answer, is it novel, is it new, and is it useful? It really exists in the realm of the way you look at the world, the way that you think, the way that you approach things. So here's some of the other working definitions I've got. 
the ability to see things that aren't there, your imagination coupled with intent. It's very theoretical and it really exists in our minds. It's all about idea generation and a way of approaching things. Whereas innovation is defined as creativity put into action. So I did hear this theme starting to come out a few times. It's the idea of applied creativity or uh, creativity that actually gets adopted, to use that language. So you can have a great creative idea. You can have a brainstorming session, come up with a 100 potential uh, new inventions. But if you don't build any of them, no innovation has occurred. Creativity might have occurred, but no innovation has occurred until you've actually produced something that people can hold or see or touch or experience. So you can think of creativity as being a bit more theoretical. It's about ideas, approaches, ways of thinking, ways of doing. That is all about novelty and usefulness. And then once we take those creative ideas and we bring them into the real world and they actually exist in front of us, we've now done innovation. We can do our innovation by applying those creative ideas and building them and making them happen. And I think a lot of you are in the realm of trying to build things and make them happen. So we're gonna talk about how do we do that? How do we come up with creative ideas and then actually build them? How do we see them come to life? And we're gonna talk about that through the approach of problem solving methodologies, specifically for this session, design thinking. Can you put up your hand if you're familiar with design thinking? Is this something where, okay, cool, new to most people, love that. Uh, so we're gonna talk about design thinking. Um, this is a problem solving methodology that takes us from recognizing a problem to thinking of creative ideas to solve that problem, and then ultimately innovative solutions that we can build. So the idea of uh, uh, problem solving methodology originated from this old white dude, as most things that we talk about do uh, originate from old white dudes. Um, this is Alex Osborne. He was an ad executive in the 1950s. Has anybody seen the show Mad Men? This is now getting a bit dated. Yeah, a couple people. <laughs> It used to be like all the rage and now my students don't know what that is. Mad Men is a show, um, very popular show, was a popular show about ad executives in the 1950s. Alex Osborne was one of those guys. So his job was getting his agency together to come up with creative new ways to sell products, new ways to reach customers, new ways to create advertisements. And he had worked out a methodology that worked really well in his agency. He invented the word brainstorming. So if you've ever talked about brainstorming, you can thank Mr. Osborne for that word. And he had sort of started to formalize this process that really worked well for him and the people that they worked, he worked with to go from a problem to a solution, to go from how are we gonna sell more cigarettes to children, which seems to be the theme of Mad Men most of the time, uh, how are we gonna do that, to here's a creative new way that we can do it, here's some creative ideas. So he had worked out this methodology that worked pretty well, and he wanted to formalize this and spread it and study it and research it. So he partnered up with a guy named Sidney Carnes, who is a university professor, and together they formalized this seven-step process. You can check out the steps here. But basically this was a formalized step-by-step -step process that he said could result in a creative solution every time. If you just kind of went through these steps, you could go from problem to creative solution. So after they published their original CPS process, creative problem solving process, um, this idea took off and lots of other thinkers and authors took this idea and they tinkered with it and they made it their own. So now if you were to search, go on Google, look up problem solving methodologies, you will find tons of them. There are all sorts of them out there. They are all variations on this very first model, but some of them have more steps, less steps, different steps. And the one we're going to talk about today is design thinking, which I would say is by and large the most popular methodology used today. It still has some of the same kind of pieces as the original work of Osborne, but it has undergone lots of changes over time. So design thinking was made popular by an organization called IDEO. If you're not familiar with them, they, they teach uh, a lot of stuff around creativity and innovation. They teach design thinking. And they kind of perfected and started sharing this five-step model. So we're going to talk more about the steps as we go. But to give you just a very high level what we're talking about here, the five steps of design thinking are, we start with empathy. Empathy, just like we use that word in everyday life, means understanding other people's experiences. So before we build anything, before we even think about building things, we need to understand the people we are building for. What do they want? What do they need? What does their lived experience look like? Once we have that understanding and we've gotten to know the people who we're creating for, we can define the problem more succinctly, and then we move into ideation, everybody's favorite part. This is the brainstorming, the coming up with new ideas. 
And then once we've picked an idea we really like, we can prototype and test it. Um, prototype meaning build a very basic version of the idea and test it to see if it works. So this is kind of the bare bones of what design thinking is and what it looks like. And you might be able to see how this methodology tries to take us from problem through creativity, which you'll remember is coming up with ideas that are novel and useful, and into innovation, meaning we don't stop with an idea, we keep going and we actually build that idea and test it to see if it works in the real world. So we go from identifying a problem to coming up with creative ideas, and then finally building and testing something by the end of the methodology. So design thinking, a little bit more about it. It is both a process and a mindset. What do I mean by this? First of all, it is a step-by-step -step process. You can follow the steps, they're laid out for you, one, two, three, four, five, and theoretically you could follow this like a recipe or a plan to get from problem to solution. But design thinking sells itself as a little bit more than that. It is a process, but it's also a mindset or a way of thinking, a philosophy about how we should design things, how we should build things. Does anybody know what this is a picture, for, picture of, aside from grass and trees and that? It might be, I don't know where it is. It might be Queen's Park. That's, I'm not sure. Oh, I think I heard it. What are we seeing here? Yes, hand up. No, oh, <laughs> no wrong answers here. Yes? A desire path, that's right. And what's a desire path? Right, where people actually want to walk. So this, I love this image because to me this really encapsulates what we're all about when we do design thinking. So at some point, wherever this is, let's pretend it's Queen's Park because I don't know. At some point, a designer made a decision that this is where people should walk. And they built a nice little pathway. They probably poured concrete or something down here. This is where you're supposed to walk. And then there's, I think it looks like a sidewalk or a road over at the top. And then people came along, human beings, who are erratic and ridiculous. And they said, yeah, I'm not going to do that because my car is over there. So I'm just going to make a shortcut. Some people might say that people shouldn't do that. They shouldn't walk on the grass. That's bad. They shouldn't kill the grass. It looks ugly. But I would say this is an example of bad design. Whoever designed this walkway didn't understand human behavior. They didn't ask where do people want to go? Where are they trying to get to? What is the most direct route? My favorite story about desire paths is Walt Disney World. If you've been to De Walt Disney World, before they made the walkways in Walt Disney World, they actually let people into the park. There was no walkways, there was no fencing. They just released people, like a herd of people, and they watched how they moved. And then they built the walkways to reflect human movement through the park. So that is uh, the mindset of design thinking. Design thinking says designers, we're not important here. Who's important is the people we're building for, the people we're designing for. And we wanna have that philosophy or that approach to problem solving. So anything we're gonna build, it is useless if it doesn't work for actual human beings, and human beings don't always behave the way we wish they would. They don't always behave in the most orderly of ways. So design thinking, yes, it gives us a step-by-step -step methodology. It also gives us an approach, a philosophy, a way of thinking about problem solving. It's also cyclical or iterative, meaning it looks nice and neat, step one, two, three, four, five, but when you actually go to do it, you find out it's not that neat and tidy. Often we need to go back, we need to repeat steps. Often we find out the idea we started with actually sucks and people give us bad feedback. We have to go back to the drawing board. So it ends up looking a little bit more like these diagrams all over the place. So yes, it can be a step-by-step -step process, but the intention is that we use the steps when needed, where needed. So if we find out we need to go back and repeat a step, that's totally okay, that's expected. And even once we have found an idea, we might need to go back, iterate, improve it, change it, so it's an approach that's meant to be cyclical or iterative. And finally, this is really the reason I think why design thinking is so popular. It's inclusive. The whole concept is that we are designing with and for people, people who actually need things. Uh, we start with the people who we're designing for, and we end when we have a solution that works for those people. And the best insights end up coming from understanding the people we're designing for. So yes, there's five steps to design thinking, you saw them, but I kind of break it down into three main phases. This is how I think of design thinking. First, we need to understand the problem, then we need to find a solution, and then we need to take some sort of action to build or to test our idea. So I'm gonna talk about it in these three phases. The first being understanding the problem. 
So empathize and define. This is where we start. How do we do this? What does this look like? Oh, yeah. I like this little quote from Albert Einstein. This is just to kick us off here. Um, Albert Einstein said, if I was given an hour to solve a problem upon which my life depended, I would spend 40 minutes studying it, it being the problem, uh, 15 minutes reviewing it, and then five minutes solving it. This is my approach to design thinking as well. If we do the bulk of our work in this understanding the problem phase, the rest of the process is going to be smooth sailing. This is also our opportunity to be really creative. People think that creativity happens in the innovation uh, ideation stage, but I think a lot of the creativity actually happens here while we're, while we're empathizing with people. Because the more creative your insights are, the more creative your solutions can be. And I have some, I have some proof of this in just a minute. Um, so this first step is really important, empathy and defining the problem. Um, and yet a lot of people skip this altogether. They don't bother. They just go out and build things, and then they end up wasting their time, wasting their money, or doing harm even if they, if they create something that doesn't work very well. So here's where we're going to test. Hopefully we're going to be able to hear this because I love this video. Um, this is a gentleman by the name of Clay Christensen, recently passed away. Um, he was a big thinker, uh, academic in the world of innovation and entrepreneurship. And in this video, he's going to explain to us why we really need to understand the problem from a real world job that he worked on that I think is pretty funny. Um, I also just really like him and I, he, he's got like this nice grandfatherly feel to him. So hopefully you'll like him too. Let's see if we can hear it. Oh, we can. We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. So I wanted just to tell you a story about a project we did for one of the big fast food restaurants. They were trying to boost up the sales of their milkshakes. They had just studied this problem up at the zoo. They brought in customers who fit the profile of the quintessential milkshake consumer. They give them samples and ask, could you tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you buy more of them? Do you want it chocolatey or cheap or chunky or chewy or they get very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions, and it had no impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question on his mind, and that was, I wonder what job arises in people's lives that caused them to come to this restaurant to hire a milkshake. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day, and just took very careful data what time did they buy these milkshakes? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or drive off with it? It turned out that nearly half of the milkshakes were sold before 8 o'clock in the morning. The people who bought them were always alone. It was the only thing they bought, and they all got in the car and drove off with it. So to figure out what job they were trying to hire to do, we came back the next day and stood outside the restaurant so we could confront these folks as they left milkshake in hand. In a language that they could understand, we essentially asked, excuse me please, but I gotta sort this puzzle out. What job were you trying to do for yourself that caused you to come here and hire that milkshake? And they'd struggle to answer, so we then helped them by asking other questions like, well, think about the last time you were in the same situation needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake. What did you hire? And then as we put all of their answers together, it became clear that they all had the same job to do in the morning. And that is they had a long and boring drive to work. And they just needed something to do while they drove to keep the commute interesting. One hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody had given them another hand and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do while they drove. They weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock. So they also wanted something that would just go down there and stay for that morning. Good question. What do I hire when I do this job? You know, I've never framed the question that way before, but last Friday, I hired a banana to do the job. Take my word for it, never hire bananas. You've gone in three minutes, you're hungry by 7.30. 
I can promise not to tell my wife. I probably hire donuts twice a week, but they don't do it well either. They're gone fast. They come all over my clothes and get my fingers dirty. Sometimes I hire bagels, but as you know, they're so dry and tasteless. And I have to steer the car with my knees while I'm putting jam on them, and then if the phone rings, you've got that crisis. I remember I hired a Snickers bar once, but uh, I felt so guilty I'd never hire a Snickers again. All right, I'm going to stop it there. So any immediate reactions or reflections to what we're hearing from Mr. Christensen here about milkshake drinkers? Any surprises from what they found out? Would you have guessed that most milkshakes were sold before 8 a.m.? Would that be your assumption? No. So, of course, if it was me and I was an executive at, um, I think it was Burger King, um, and somebody told me to try to sell more milkshakes, I would do exactly what they did. Try changing the flavor, try changing the thickness, try changing the ingredients. But once you have the insight of what that milkshake is actually doing, what purpose is it actually solving, suddenly coming up with creative solutions is a totally different experience. Now that we know why people are buying those milkshakes, what might we do to sell more milkshakes? Any, any first ideas? Yeah? So we could put ads on road signs. We know they're commuting, so they're going to be in their car. Yep. Open at 6 a.m. Open nice and early for all those morning commuters. Make it some sort of a breakfast promotion. Maybe have like a stamp card or put a hash brown with it. Yeah. Have a drive through Definitely. Ha yeah, it sounded like they didn't have a drive through here. So definitely have a drive through because these people are coming through in their cars. Also, by the looks of it, this was filmed in like 1985. So they probably have a drive through by now. Uh, but yeah, see how much easier it is to come up with creative solutions when we actually understand the problem and see how these solutions are so different than the ones we initially would have tried. But we wouldn't be able to come up with these ideas if we didn't have that unique insight about what people were actually doing. So we're just wasting our time and resources if we try to solve without actually understanding what people want or need. And in his words, without understanding what job people are actually trying to get done. Now, most of you uh, are not going to be trying to sell milkshakes, from my understanding, as we're in Sunnybrook Hospital today. Most of you are looking at um, medical innovations and how we can apply this to healthcare. So I have another short video. I'm just going to play a, a tiny clip from it. This comes from IDEO and a project they did at uh, a clinic called um, Cleveland Clinic. And they went in with the goal of trying to improve the experience of patients moving through the hospital. And the first stage that they did was just go in with a blank slate, an open mind, and talk to, uh, I guess you wouldn't call them customers, obviously, patients, talk to the people who were um, in their hospital to find out where are their potential problems or pain points that we can solve here. A little bit of a trigger warning. This video is a little bit emotional. It's not gory or anything, but sometimes I have had students cry. So if you don't want to cry, maybe avert your eyes. Um, but this is an example of a real world project um, and how IDEO went into this space to empathize and to try to gain some insights on problems they could fix in a hospital environment. Might be a little bit more relevant to you folks. This is not part of my presentation. I do not work for Bumble.
That's always the one that gets me, so I'm going to stop it there. Um, but you can see how uh, deep we're going here, right, with empathizing with people in this complex system, this complex environment. And already, just from this tiny clip, can you pick out some pain points or areas where there might be improvements that could be made in this system in communications or the roles that staff are playing or the way even the space is set up? the complexity of all these different people having these different experiences. Were there any that you noticed right away that you thought, oh, there's a problem that could be addressed? The wait time. The wait time obviously, that's a huge problem we're all dealing with right now. Communication. communication lots of different communication uh, pieces. They're not understanding or, or not in a place to be able to hear and receive because we're too shocked. Any other ones? I just showed you a tiny little clip, so that's probably pretty good. Okay. So this is what we mean by empathy. This is what we mean by gaining insights before we start solving. And hopefully those were some oops, helpful illustrations for you. No, oh, got a couple. There we go. You can get a one dollar. Oh my goodness. What have I done? For coffee or two dollar latte at AW. Thank you. Where is my what have I done, Clara? No. Oh, there we go. It was just hidden. Perfect. All right, so how do we collect this kind of primary data? Um, you already heard in those two videos or saw in those two videos some of the main ways that we do it. This is Um, so here's some of the main ways that we use in design thinking, interviewing, obviously talking to people, ethnography, which is just a fancy word really for observation, so doing observations in real life. We can also do online ethnography. This is kind of a burgeoning area of study, which is observing people's behavior, but through an online lens of what they do in their online lives. So you can think about people posting on Reddit or commenting on articles or posting on their social media. We can also witness their thoughts, feelings, experiences through that kind of content to, again, gain deeper understanding. Um, you can think about, for example, with uh, COVID-19 and the vaccinations. I'm sure we could find all sorts of online ethnography. Don't know how helpful it would be, but all sorts of insights that people were sharing about their opinions about things like vaccines or reception of vaccines. Yeah. Uh, were the platforms ever users, um, like cameras or Good question. I think that would be just kind of straight on ethnography, but using technology. So watching the movement of people through space or watching how spaces are used from kind of a bird's eye view. Yeah, that would be like a form of observation. Um, I don't know if it would have its own unique name, but online ethnography is more about looking at what people are putting out there into the world um, in terms of sharing their thoughts, feelings, perceptions, which we all maybe do a little bit too much in the online world. These are the main modes we use uh, for primary data collection in design thinking. We typically stay away from surveys. They are not particularly helpful to give us these deep insights. We really want to connect with actual people. And you can see from that video that was done at Cleveland Clinic how deep we're getting to really get that human insight into what people are experiencing. So once we've gathered all this data, once we've talked to people, we've observed, we've hopefully understood why are they buying milkshakes or what is their experience like at the hospital, our next step is to define the problem. And the define stage, I think, is the trickiest one to get, even though it's quite quick and, uh, in theory, quite simple. But your goal is to take that big, complex, ambiguous problem that you started with and try to narrow it down to something that is actionable. In most cases, when we try to tackle something like hospital wait times that somebody suggested, um, we're not going to be able to solve that with one solution. We're not going to be able to just, you know, invent one thing and now there will never be another hospital wait time. And so what we can do is take that data we've gathered and try to find where can we have an impact? Where is there somebody who's having an experience that we can improve? We might not be able to solve all of it, but where can we put a frame around one piece that we can tackle? Something manageable, something actionable. So defining the problem is a bit of a science and it's a bit of an art. We're using data, so that sounds scientific. It sounds like something we could do, you know, just compute it and we'd have an answer. But it's also a bit of an art because we're trying to take this, uh, the insights that we're gaining from people, qualitative information, and we're trying to somehow boil that down and understand it in a new way. So synthesizing that data, it's pretty complicated. There's no one right way. 
we could all study the same problem in this room and we would all define the problem in a unique way because it would be based on what we learned, what we were able to gather from the data that we saw. But defining the problem, I'm gonna give you a bit more of like a practical example to hopefully help you. So this is a problem that I see all the time. I work in higher education and we're always talking about our students need better mental health support. It's a big topic, it's in the news all the time, something we're trying to help. And the typical approach we end up taking is usually to just go with a hunch or an intu intuition, uh, maybe do research, what are other colleges or universities doing and just copy them, maybe just go for whatever is the cheapest or easiest to implement. But what ends up happening when we do that is we get these bad surface level band-aid solutions. This is a tweet I saw that I thought was just a perfect illustration of this. Universities say, need help? Use our great mental health services. And those services are one golden retriever that comes to the library once a week, one therapist who's trying to serve 40,000 students, and a bathroom stall you can cry in if you need it. Not the best way of addressing mental health. And I know a lot of you go to U of T, so I feel like that's relevant. No hate to U of T. Um, so what can we do instead? How do we not have this Band-Aid approach? So we would go out, we'd collect this data, we would talk to our students, we'd hear from them, what do you think, uh, what do you need, what are the gaps you see, what does a typical day look for, like for you as a student, uh, when have you needed mental health support, what did you do? We'd gather all that data, and then we would try to put it into a point of view statement that would help communicate what our user is experiencing. So our user, for example, students need something, what did they need? What did we hear from them? And why do they need it? What is our unique insight we were able to pick up? So here's an example of one from when we actually did this study at Sheridan College. Uh, one particular user is commuter students, students who live far away from the campus and they're spending over an hour coming onto the school campus. And they said they have no community at the school. They feel completely detached from it because their commute is so long, they can't join any clubs, they can't do any sports, they feel no connection to their school. So our point of view statement here could be commuter students who are traveling to school need other ways to feel connected because they can't join clubs, they can't join um, sports and do those kind of typical things, not accessible. So this can give us a really actionable part of that problem. I probably can't solve mental health for students, it's probably just too big and ambiguous, but I might be able to solve this. I might be able to find a way to help these specific students. So from this point of view statement, we can turn it into a question that allows us to start thinking of ideas. We wanna turn it into a question that is insightful, meaningful, wide enough that we can think of lots of potential solutions, but specific and actionable enough that we can actually try to address it. So here's an example I came up with for that particular point of view. We heard about that student and what their point of view was. So we might ask something like, how can we make students feel just as supported and connected when they're at home? as they would if they were on campus connecting with friends, as an example. From here, we're in a position where we can start coming up with ideas. If I just say to you, solve student mental health, you're probably gonna look at me and your jaw is gonna drop and you're gonna be like, I don't know. But if I say to you, how can we make these students feel supported when they're at home so they feel like they're on campus, suddenly we can start thinking of ideas, right? This is something we can actually address and tackle. And that takes us to ideation, the next stage in our design thinking process. This is where we start generating and evaluating ideas. This is divided into two phases, divergent and convergent thinking. Does anybody know what divergent thinking means? Is this a word we know? Usually somebody says there's a movie called Divergent. That's true. What is divergent thinking? I did, yeah. So what is diverging then? Mm -hmm. Great definition. Diverging is when we're going in lots of different directions, spreading out. Converging is when we're narrowing in on one thing. And so here's a little illustration of that. We go through a phase where we are divergent. We're thinking of lots of potential ideas. We're making lots of opportunities and then eventually we have to converge and pick the best one. So these are two different phases and two different types of thinking that we engage. Divergent thinking was first defined by a guy, again, old white dude, I told you, uh, J.P. Guilford, again in the 1950s. This is really when creativity and innovation research started. This was a time when the economy was radically changing. People were moving from kind of blue collar labor jobs into more um, desk jobs. And they thought that the future of the economy was gonna be in creativity and innovation. They still think that now. That's still something I hear all the time. 
but they thought that was the way of the future. We had to make sure our students knew how to be creative. And so J.P. Guilford came up with this idea that we need to learn how to be more divergent. We need to learn how to start from one starting point and come up with lots of diverse ideas. And he came up with ways to test your ability to do this. He came up with different measurements to be able to assess how divergent you are. So we're going to give it a little try, just a little baby try. This won't be the real test, but we'll do it a little bit together here. So we're going to try to be divergent. And the goals of divergent, uh, being divergent is go for qu quantity over quality. We're not judging the ideas. Bad ideas are cool. We're good with that. We're not going to worry about being judged. We're not going to worry about being silly and say our ideas are bad. We're okay with that. And we're going to let everybody participate. This is what divergent thinking looks like. So his most famous test of divergent thinking is called the alternative uses test. And it's super duper simple. He says, this is a brick. We've all seen a brick before, yes? We know what a brick is used for. Typically, it's used to build a wall, a house. What else could we use a brick for? That's it. That's the whole test. So shout out to me, what else could we use a brick for if we're not using it to build a house or a wall? What else can we do with it? Self-defense. It's a weapon. Breaking and entering. It's still kind of a weapon. What else can we do? It's a paperweight. Holding our stuff on our desk. What else could it be? A door stopper. Absolutely. Fix your unlevel table. Train. Oh, yeah. Lift weights. Lift bricks. Absolutely. Are we stalling already? Come on. We can do more. What else could we use a brick for? Stop a car from rolling. Stop a car from rolling. Yeah. Kind of like a, a book end, but a car end. Any others? Yeah? A hot plate or a protect your countertops? Like a step stool? Step up on your brick? Yeah, sure, absolutely. No bad ideas. That's what I said, right? All right, so this is an illustration of his alternative uses test. And you would sit down and you'd get a certain amount of time to do this. You'd come up with as many ideas as you could, and then he would score you across these metrics. Fluency, how many ideas could you come up with in that amount of time? Flexibility, how many different conceptual categories did you kind of think of? When I do this with my students, everything they say is a weapon. They're going to smash a window. They're going to smash a person. They're going to smash all these things. Um, not the most flexible. Hopefully, you can think a little more flexibly. Uh, originality, did anybody else think of the same idea you did? If you're the only one who thought of it, pretty original. If everybody thought of it, maybe not so original. And elaboration, how elaborate is the idea? How far did you have to go from the original brick to transform it? So one example of that would be, what if we break the brick down, turn it into dust, then we add some water and glue, then we form it into a clay, and then we use that clay to make a sculpture? That's a very elaborate idea, right? A little bit more elaborate than, than paperweight or, or doorstop. So this is how we would measure our divergent thinking. And this is the first step in ideation. Let go of judgment, quantity over quality, no bad ideas, just let them all flow, trying to be as flexible and fluent and original as possible. And so divergent thinking kind of like gets all the praise and everybody thinks that's what it means to be creative, is to be divergent. But remember, all the way back to like slide number one, creativity is not just about being unique, it's also about being useful. And so if we don't use our convergent thinking and that analytical side of our brain, all of our ideas are going to be very silly. I have this quote here from Arthur Cropley who says, unfettered divergent thinking sounds like effortless creativity, but really you run the risk of generating quasi-creativity if you're not adapting it to reality. So great to come up with lots of silly ideas, but at the end of the day, we want to use that convergent thinking too. Yeah. Oh gosh, okay. I have a difficult answer. We'll see if they match. What was, so the question is, what was useful? What was useful about Picasso's creativity? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Take the heat off me. Mm -hmm. What do we think? Anybody want to take a stab at that? The question for those at home is, how was Picasso's art useful? Anyone want to take a stab? Yeah. Sure, so he started a new art form, which you could maybe say is, is useful. Yeah? Could be, yeah, so is, is pure entertainment uh, a form of usefulness? Any other thoughts on this or comments on this? 
So I teach at Sheridan College. If you're familiar with Sheridan College, it's mostly artists. So this is a difficult question, but not one that doesn't come up every time. I tell my art students that creativity has to be useful. They usually want to get mad at me with their pitchforks. But I always say, who defines what is useful? That is like a super subjective term. If you think it's useful or it's useful to you, then perhaps it is useful. And people pay a lot of money to go to art galleries and look at art that I may not think is super useful, but they're getting something out of that, right? So I think that useful should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but also when we're talking about this form of creativity and we're talking about moving towards innovation, then the usefulness piece becomes a little more um, necessary because we're talking about things that are going to be useful in the real world. But thank you for the question and thank you for the point and hopefully that somewhat addresses it. Um, the convergent thinking is all about finding the best idea, taking, um, making sure, did we take all the information into account, being critical, thinking about things like, is there a bias here? Am I, um, am I potentially biasing my idea or does it actually work? And it helps us stay on track, helps us remember what we're here to do. So these are two distinct phases. We use them all the time without even thinking about it. We move between divergent thinking and convergent thinking, but we can make the act of choice to separate them out and, and say, okay, right now I'm going to just be divergent. I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm just going to let it go. And then now I'm going to be uh, more analytical. I'm going to judge the ideas and apply my, my uh, criteria to them. And then remember, it's cyclical. So whatever idea you come up with, you can always go back and diverge again and think of ways to make the idea even better. So there's not like a one shot. Think of all the ideas, judge them, and you're done. It's a cycle. We can go through it over and over until we're happy with it. So then the last step, prototyping and implementing. This is where we actually take action. And I know we're getting close to time, but I think we're going to be OK. So what does prototyping mean? Prototyping is when we build a very basic early version of whatever it is that we want to make or whatever it is we want to bring into the world. Lots of different ways we can prototype. These are the main ones that we see. Low and high fidelity prototypes are what most of you are probably thinking if you've ever seen or pictured a prototype. A low fidelity prototype is like a mock-up, a sketch, a diagram, something that helps you communicate what your idea is. It's not built yet, it's not real, but at least it helps you illustrate it. A high fidelity prototype, this is when we actually start building the thing. So we're using 3D printers, we're using cheap materials to build a basic version, or for making software, this is like our beta version, our first kind of usable, testable version of our software. But not all ideas can be physically built. Some ideas are process or service based. Some ideas we don't have the technology to build. So what do we do then? If the idea is service based, for example, how do we improve uh, navigation in the hospital? How do we help make sure students are able to find this random room in the middle of the breast imaging center? How do we do that? We can't really 3D print uh, a test sample for that. So instead, we can run what is called a pilot. This is basically a small version of your eventual service idea where you test it out on a small scale, see if it works or if it doesn't, get feedback, and then improve it or not, decide to drop it. And what if we don't have the technology yet to build what we want to build? We have a great idea, but we don't know how to make it. We don't actually have the technology. Then we can do something called Wizard of Oz testing. This is my favorite. This is where we lie to people. My favorite example of this is IBM. IBM had the idea of making speech-to-text devices long before this was a thing. They thought, okay, should we invest in the technology to make devices able to take speech and convert it to text? They didn't want to invest a whole bunch of money into building the technology if nobody would buy it. So what did they do? They invited people in, and they told them, this device can convert your speech to text. Just talk to it, and it'll turn it into text. Try it for a day and let us know what you think. And I said, okay. So they sat down, and they're using their device, and they're talking to it. Well, behind the curtain is somebody madly typing away, transcribing what they're saying. So the computer's not actually doing it all. They think that the computer's doing it, but really it's a human being behind the curtain. That's why we call it Wizard of Oz. And the human being is the one manually inputting the text. At the end of the day, IBM says to the people, what would you think? Did you like it? And they overwhelmingly said, no, I wouldn't use this. I didn't like it. I was in a room with lots of other people, and everybody's talking, and it's really confusing. It gets mixed up between who's talking. I'm getting distracted listening to other people talking. I don't like it. And IBM said, okay, we're not going to invest in this technology. And they didn't. Now, eventually, of course, we know smartphones. Now we probably all use this uh, functionality. But at that time, it didn't make sense for them, and that test helped them prove it. So even if you don't have the ability to build your technology yet, you might be able to think of some clever ways to test it to get that user feedback and to see would the idea work. 
So why do we prototype? Why do you think we bother spending our time and resources doing this? Why don't we just go straight to building? Yeah? To fix glitches, absolutely. Find the problems and get them solved. People often break our first version. Absolutely. We don't want to spend our time and money. Yes, if it's not going to work, we don't want to spend all of our time and money. We want to fail fast. Mm -hmm. So explain for us in case we don't know what is product market fit. Is anybody going to buy it? Does anybody actually want this thing? Is it, is it feasible? Is it viable? Will people pay for it? Will they pay enough for it to make it sustainable? Yep. Could be a demo. We have to have something to show investors. We have to have something to show people to demo it in order for them to be willing to invest in the idea. Yep. Yeah, so we can test out different things, see what works, what doesn't, and make a final decision. Yeah, it could if you find out. Mm. Yeah, so that prototype could show you what is most needed in this product. Maybe some of the features aren't needed. Maybe we can use them in other prototypes. You're all geniuses. I think you said all the things that I suggested. Um, to help us communicate, it's a good communication tool so we can show it to people. It helps us fail as quickly and cheaply as possible. We don't have to invest as much resource. It helps us test out the possibilities and helps us test product market fit or user approval. Do people even actually want this? Um, my startup, Hope Pet Foods, which um, was mentioned very briefly at the beginning, we, we make alternative pet foods out of alternative ingredients that haven't been used for pets before. And when we went to make our first batch of this food and we went to a manufacturer, they said the minimum order we could do was four tons. Do you know what four tons of dog food looks like? I have a lot of dogs at home, but not enough to feed four tons of food. And so we were like, okay, we'll come back when we know that A, people will buy it, and B, we know our formula works. So we went to a university, made a very small batch, tested it, gave it to dogs, did all the stuff we needed to do to make sure it was healthy and nutritious. Then we went and made four tons once we knew or at least had a bit better of an idea that the idea was going to work the way we hoped. And ultimately, if we do all these steps and we do it all right, then our hope is whatever we come up with at the end of the day is going to fit in this innovation sweet spot, which is where we meet from all of our different goals of anything new we are producing. It should be feasible, meaning we have the technology, we have the ability, we can do it. It has to be desirable. Humans have to want it, and they have to want it enough that they're willing to pay for or do whatever they need to do to get it. And it has to be viable. We have to be able to afford making it and sustainably be able to continue making it. And for a long time, this is what we have referred to as the innovation sweet spot, the intersection of these three circles. But I actually like this new model that has been um, developed by the Design Council that says we actually have a responsibility to add one more circle to this, which is integrity or impact. You can probably think of some innovative technologies that have come out in the last, I don't know, year that maybe have some ethical implications. Uh, me as a professor, I'm dealing every day with one of these. It's called ChatGPT. Um, when we just release new innovations to the world, sometimes they cause major impact. We don't know what the impact yet of AI is going to be, but we can look at other innovations that happened like a decade ago, Airbnb, Uber, and we can look at what were the side effects of these things. What happened because of Airbnb? Maybe it um, contributed to the housing unaffordability crisis that we're in. Maybe it's uh, contributed to gentrification. All of these things that really I don't think the creators thought about. I don't think they worried too much about the impact of that idea. They had something disruptive and they went for it. Um, and so we're saying maybe innovators need to slow a bit down and also think about this fourth circle, which is integrity or impact. What's the side effect going to be? Mm -hmm. 
just starting in the first place. Anything past like the three percent of growth is like a huge thing. Mm -hmm. So like, well, I hope that this thing doesn't happen. Right. Yeah, for sure. We can't we can't predict the future. <laughs> so it's a great point. Can we predict the future with perfect uh, clarity? Of course not. We can use different strategies like future thinking. You want to bring me back for another session while I'll teach you about future thinking. We do have strategies we can use to try to predict impact, but of course uh, we can't, you know, without uh, a shadow of a doubt, we can't predict the future. But what we can do is try to put in place some mitigation plans and think about what might be the risks and stay sensitive to that. So I think innovators, creators, we have a responsibility to also keep that in mind. What is the impact that I'm going to have and be a little bit sensitive to changing conditions to reflect and to respond to um, any side effects. And that is, okay, not bad, five minutes over. That is the lecture portion of my talk. I think we're going to take a break and have some refreshments, and then we're going to give this a try. We're going to do like a little design thinking mini boot camp uh, go of it. So um, we're good to go for some food and refreshments? Okay.